Welcome to the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine's Research Learning Series, or RLS. I am Dr. Chen from University of California, San Diego, and am delighted to be moderating this session called Pearls and Pitfalls of Grant Writing. We are very excited to have three different emergency medicine physicians here with us today who are experienced grant-funded researchers. We will start with some introductions and then do some rapid-fire questions to our panelists, giving them just a few minutes to answer each question. We hope our listeners will learn some helpful and practical information about grant funding for research. I'm trying to, okay, sorry. Dr. Stephanie Yucker is an Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine and Assistant Director of Acute Care Research in the Duke University Department of Emergency Medicine. Her primary research interest is in preventing and treating pain and opioid use disorder by incorporating multimodal non-pharmacologic strategies in the emergency department. Her work emphasizes multi-professional collaborations and has a special focus on improving health equity and access to care for underserved populations. Dr. Jeff Klein is a professor and associate chair of research at Wayne State University School of Medicine's Department of Emergency Medicine. He is the editor-in-chief of Academic Emergency Medicine and has secured numerous research grants and he holds many medical patents. His diagnostic research interests focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of venous thromboembolism in emergency care setting and mentoring physician scientists in emergency care. Dr. Catherine Staten is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Global Health and Vice Chair of Faculty Development and Research Strategy in the Duke De Department of Emergency Medicine. She is also the director of the Duke Gemini, or Global Emergency Medicine Innovation and Implementation Research Center, where she mentors or partners with faculty and students in high, middle, and low-income settings to conduct implementation science to improve access to quality acute care. All right, so let's start with our questions. So first question, Many emergency physicians do research without funding, many of whom wish they had funding, but are not really sure how to get it. Let's start with some basic questions. Why should researchers obtain grant funding? What kind of grant funding is available for emergency medicine researchers out there? And what other resources are available to find out more about these opportunities? So Dr. Staten, why don't we start with you? Do you mind um, sharing us um, or answering this question for us. Sure, happy to. Thanks um, for the opportunity to be here, Dr. Chen. Um, so the first question you ask is really interesting. Why to seek out grant funding for your research? Well, honestly, with more grant funding, you can collect better data, and with better data, you can ask and answer more interesting questions, um, questions that have an impact and the things that you're most interested in, whether that's clinical care of patients that you're dealing with or how to solve a problem that you're facing. So the funds that you're able to collect through grants are able to streamline the process of collecting data, analyzing data, and producing the results um, or the answers that you're looking for. The larger picture there is that it's also able to create infrastructure, put people to work, create jobs and positions, um, and create a team for you to be able to do something that you love. Um, right. So in my world in global health, we have people both globally and locally that have jobs and positions and are able to ask questions and do research based upon the grant funding that we've created. Um, and this becomes a little team and a little family that we love working together and it's a really fun process. So how do we find this kind of funding? Um, it depends on where you are. <laughs> it depends on the institute that you're in, the school that you're in, what kind of research that you're doing, what you're interested in. There is grant funding anywhere from $1,000 or $500 all the way up to $5 million, uh, depending on the questions that you're asking and how you want to find it and what you want to look for. Um, how do you find this information? So when I started out, I would spend about an hour a week on internet just searching for where this information is. Um, many universities will end up collating this information for you so you can find it. Going to um, academies or um, uh, groups like SAEM who also list those kind of grants that they have available is a great way to start. Uh, but a lot of organizations will have the same thing. Googling it, even if you don't find anything, is really giving you some answers there too. 
So really the first step is understanding what's locally available for small grants to be able to get you started. Um, and definitely mentors or partners in their research process can help answer those questions as well. Great, thank you, Dr. Um, Satan. All right, so let's move on to question number two. So this question, I actually um, am wondering, so all of you have successfully obtained funding for your research. We would be interested to briefly hear about your individual experiences. We are hoping you could take us back and share with us what you learned in the process. Please tell us your experience applying for your first grant. How many grants have you applied for? What grants have you received? And how much you received in funding? Uh, and what obstacles and challenges that you faced and what helped you succeed. So let's start with Dr. Yucker on this question. All right, thanks, uh, Dr. Chen. Um, I actually started with um, one primary unfunded project um, that I worked on with my mentor um, to generate preliminary data for a bigger project. Um, I think one of the important things when you're thinking about developing projects and getting funding is don't just sign up for small one-off projects. Think about which direction you're trying to head into, which bigger questions you're trying to answer, and then build a portfolio towards that bigger picture. Um, and so each step of the way, if you start with a small unfunded project, have a mind for how how you're creating data, um, preliminary data, pilot data, as well as publications that then build to your next step. Um, and so from that, I was able to um, apply for local institutional funding. Um, and there was a special call for um, uh, projects to mitigate the opioid uh, um, issue. And so that actually aligned well with my research. So I was able to apply for that. And then that enabled a pilot project, which then led to me being able to apply for a larger uh, federal SAMHSA grant um, in order to uh, do a large multi, I mean, sorry, a large <laughs> pragmatic randomized trial of acupuncture uh, for acute pain management. So, um, so, yeah, that's the biggest thing, um, because even when you're applying for small grants, you don't want to shortcut the process. Um, and so the, the best way to do that is that you're always writing towards the bigger grant and, and using work that you've done previously to build, build up to that. Great, thank you. And um, Dr. Staten, would you like to share with us your experience? Sure. So um, you asked about my experience in terms of writing my first grant. So my first grant I wrote as a postdoc, I knew nothing about grant writing and I had great mentors. Um, and this was a supplement on a larger NIH grant that again, I knew really nothing about, um, but my mentors are really great to be able to sort of point out which areas to focus on, what to write about, um, and to be able to help me gain that first project. After I was able to be successful in that, the output of that failed completely. Um, and I actually learned more from that grant so that I learned from any of the other grants moving forward because uh, I learned about what was important to be able to conduct research and to get a grant going and to have the research be productive and answer the questions that you need. So failure is not always bad. It's sometimes really good and teaches you a lot. Um, since then, I've probably have written upwards of a hundred different grants, anywhere from $50 or a thousand dollar grants all the way up to multi-million dollar grants. Um, and it just depends on what the question is and what the time period is and how quickly, as Dr. Eicher was saying, how quickly we wanna build this question and research line, how big the data is that we need to collect. And so the size and scope varies based upon um, when we're writing it or where we're writing it and what that looks like. Um, I've used tons of different grant mechanisms, everything from SAEM and GEMA to foundation grants, Gates grants at this point, and a large amount of NIH grants. I've also been lucky enough to be able to apply for and, and receive 
training grants through the NIH to be able to train um, learners in Tanzania to, to obtain their master's and PhD um, programs. I had no idea how to write a grant like that, and I don't even have my own PhD. So it was really interesting to be creating a, this training grant about something that I, I don't even know that I can train or teach people in. Um, but again, it's a learning experience. And just like we love to learn something new on shift every day, it's the same thing in research is that you can learn um, how to then write a curriculum and how to assess that curriculum and how to have uh, sort of outcomes that are research directed in that area. So the challenges are really for me, it's been open to learn something new every day, learn a new method, learn a new process, challenge myself to, to take the next innovative step for what is needed in the locations where I work um, and to not shy away from the big grants because you never know what will happen if you try for it. Um, and then to create a team to be able to make sure we can do what we say we're doing um, in the beginning, if I don't know what I'm doing, I've got to find somebody who does to be able to part with, to teach me how to do it, but also to do it right. Whether that comes to writing the grant or doing the grant or having the infrastructure to do it successfully. Great. Thank you, Dr. Staten. So Dr. Klein, would you like to share with us your experience? You probably, uh, First of all, one of the current experiences is that I don't know how to tell time. So I'm not sure. Hey, Dr. Klein, we're having a confident speaker when I thought this was supposed to be a two. <laughs> yeah, we're having trouble hearing your connection. If you could. I'm going to be on Wi-Fi in about two minutes, so um, maybe go into an, to the next um, yeah. question or questioner. Yeah, we'll we'll circle back to you. Right there. We'll, we'll circle back to you. All right, so let's move forward. Um, so next question. So we're going to actually skip to question number four here. So there are many, there are often uh, many applications for different grants and often many disappointments by individuals who put so much effort into putting their grant application together but are denied funding. What kind of things are grant reviewers looking for in grant application? Who gets funding? What are some fatal flaws or things that prevent grant applications? applicants from getting funding. So I actually have this uh, um, question, because I, uh, Dr. Satan is one of our um, mentors at the SAM grant workshop. So Dr. Satan, would you like to share with us what are some flaws that you notice from the applicants? Yeah, definitely. So one of the first things to start out with is understand who's giving the money and why they're giving the money. Um, whether it's an institute or whether it is a, a, a group or foundation, they usually put out in their re request overall or their program announcement or request for proposals, they put out exactly their goals for the application. And this includes the type of research they want to fund, who they want to fund, how they want to fund it, and what their focus is, whether it's more programmatic or whether it's more research. Um, and really understanding the group who's funding you and what they want to fund goes a huge way in being able to be successful in the grant. Because if you're if you're proposing one thing and they want something completely different, it's just not gonna work. Um, so looking very closely at the RFP from the very beginning um, and almost memorizing it to the point where you understand exactly what's behind all of it. The next is to identify the gap that you're gonna fill. What do I mean by that? What is the problem that you are creating a solution for? And it has to be very explicit. Some people are doing a great job of creating an innovation and, and a solution, but there's not actually a problem that we needed that solution for. Um, so why would we do that? So both the gap or the, the problem that you're trying to fix, as well as the describing your solution or your answer um, are very important. One of the things is to be innovative. Um, we don't wanna do the same thing as the next person is doing, but you have to balance innovation and risk. 
um, depending on the amount of money, people want far less risk um, unless they're calling for something really risky. And that brings it back to the first point that I made. The methods themselves in your grant is not just to describe what you're planning on doing. It's to talk about your experience in that area. It demonstrates you have experience to be able to do this by discussing the methods in a very clear and concise way. You almost should be able to write it so easily that anybody who doesn't know the topic can understand what's happening. Um, and then that essentially shows that you have the expertise to not only to do this, but to do this with ease. So your methods really should take the most amount of your time and they should be focused on making this really easy to understand and, and to conduct. And finally, get a team and or mentors or advisors that really help the process to move forward. If you are working on something with data science and you don't have a data scientist described or on your team, then you have a big gap and this won't be an impactful project nor it won't be accepted. Great, thank you, Dr. Staten. All right, so for time purposes, we're gonna move on to the next question. Okay, so circling to back question number three. So it is so easy to get distracted with other projects and get pulled in other directions in academic medicine. It seems that most grant funded researchers have a very focused area of research. Do you agree with this statement and any recommendations to researchers on how to find their focus? Not all research is fundable. So can you also please comment on finding a focus that is potentially fundable? Um, Dr. Klein, I'm wondering if you can help us answer this question. Um, the first step in that, whenever I have a new mentee that is looking to make a career in research is to find out what they're passionate about and then try to do the best I can to match that with a mentor. I mean, fortunately, most people in emergency medicine are interested in too many things. A lot of times the reason they went into emergency medicine is they have a hard time focusing because they're used to seeing one patient and going in and seeing something completely different and they like that variety. So I try to figure out what people are are passionate about and uh, then also figure in what is the probability that you're going to get funded. I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a mentee who was interested in regional anesthesia, and he wanted to try to make a career out of that. Now, that is pretty good if you want to be a proceduralist, but there's not really a lot of discovery that could happen there. It's more education, and it's pretty unlikely to you know, lead to avenues that would make you an independent investigator with the NIH or a PCORI, you know, maybe a PCORI grant, but it really narrowed it down. And um, so what we ended up with saying, you're interested in pain. So let's, let's start talking about a different kind of pain and a different way to look at it. So I think a lot of this is the, the dyadic interplay between a mentor and a mentee to find out what they're passionate about. But you know, having someone that can help guide that passion toward a place that they can get funded and um, and stay funded. So um, it's it's fairly general, but it you know this whatever you study, it has to get your heart rate up. You have to really want to be part of it, and and I think it's a a real gift when you can be fifty eight years old and still just be as be just as excited about reading a paper on pulmonary embolism as you were when you were 30. And that's that's a gift that I have that I want to try to keep giving to all the people that I mentor. And, um, but also make sure that they have a margin for their mission, meaning grant money. Thank you, Dr. Klein. All right, moving on to question number five. It often takes a village to get grant funding. Who are these individuals who were part of your, or who are part of your grant application and who can help you with your grant application? Please comment on mentorship and grant funding and support you have had in your respective institutions that have helped you succeed. So Dr. Iker, I actually have this question for you. Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it really is a village, especially for, um, 
clinical research. It's very much team science. Um, and so you really want to make sure you have um, co-investigators who have the different areas of expertise that you need on your application. Um, biostatistical support, super critical, um, but also if you're doing um, specialized methodology, make sure you have that type of methodologist on your team. If you're doing qualitative work, you need a qualitative expert. If you're doing data science, that type of expertise, all of those things. Um, and then really strong mentorship, um, not only with um, the content expertise to help, but also just the experience writing. It's helpful to have previous uh, funded grants to use as templates. Um, and, and different people have different writing styles, so it's nice to see a, a variety so you can kind of mold what works best with your writing style. Um, but you, and, and to get people to help write sections based on their expertise, but it does need to sound like it's coming from one voice. So you really have to be the one to then go back through and, and bring it together as a strong sounding grant. Um, and then the other major group that you don't want to forget to include early on in the process is your grant manager. Um, not just for helping with the money support, but, um, getting all the extra documents you need. There are a lot of supplemental documents that need to get put together. Uh, so often that can be something where you can divide and conquer with your group. And don't, and don't shortcut the amount of time you spend. You should probably start at least a couple of months ahead of time. Great, thank you. Actually, for this question, we're going to he also hear from our two other uh, panelists. So, Dr. Klein, do you mind commenting on this question as well, too? Um, who are the uh, people on your grant application and who are the people who can really help us with our uh, grant funding? Well, I have a thought going through my head that I want to state, and I'll get a lot of inquiries from folks that consider themselves orphaned at small institutions and don't have resources. Um, also, folks in the military, um, in military service that are interested in research and don't have mentorship or a statistician or a methodologist. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm going to, I got to give an answer to those folks that is a little bit painful, but it is that you've got to move. I mean, you've got to go to a place. It's you it conceivably you could do it virtually. I mean, especially if you're if you're doing something in informatics, but you're probably not going to ever put anything together that someone is going to want to put a lot of money into. At some point, you can do that. Um, you can get to the point where you can run a network from you know, your, your farm somewhere, you know, but you've got to get there and, and you've got to move. Um, but I, I, I just really echo everything that's been said that it, it takes um, lots of eyes. It takes a supportive, but critical colleague who reads your aims and says, these are too dependent or these are too disconnected. You know, writing three aims. Remember, when you write an aim, it better make you feel uncomfortable. You better get kind of twitchy and feel like, oh, can I really do that? But you got to, you know, what I see almost all the time are vague aims. And you need colleagues to help you write specific aims. You are writing a deliverable. And then the next one has to, has to be connected to the first one, but not completely dependent. And being able to do that takes a lot of eyes. And it, you know, it takes a lot of rewriting and we, we kind of fall in love with what we write and we don't want to criticize it. And you've got to get people to criticize those interdependent aims because back to the first to question before what kills grants is the specific aims page. You know, it's the, it's the, the kitchen of the house. It's the curb appeal. And if you don't have that curb appeal, the buyer is going to drive right on past and go look at another house. So you, we really need help with writing the specific aim page. 
Thank you, Dr. Klein. Dr. Satan, uh, would you like to comment on this question? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. The only things that I can add is that in medical school, we're not taught to write. All through our residency, we're not taught to write. Um, and grant writing is a very specific skill that I think is an art. I think it's a lot of fun because you can learn how to do it differently and build upon the skill year after year. But I think it requires a lot of education. So within my institution, we have multiple grant writing sessions per year. And I probably have taken five to six, maybe seven of it um, year after year after year to continue to improve this art. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is I see every grant as a living document. Nothing, even once it's turned in, nothing is finalized. I can always improve it. Uh, and what that means is all I'm doing is integrating the responses that I'm getting back and trying to make it better to put it in again, because I, I never expect that it actually get funded. Um, I'm almost anticipating that someone will find some flaws in it. The things that our institution that have really helped with has been multidisciplinary feedback. So we do mock reviews on all of our grants, um, a lot within our department, a lot outside of our department to get different experience and expertise to, to look at these grants and to find these holes, like Dr. Clyde was saying, to get us to think about how to do it differently, about how we can do this with different methods coming from different perspectives, maybe thinking about it to make it more generalizable, um, whether for our site or our international components um, or the methods that we're integrating. So um, most in universities that are large academically minded universities can have some processes like this. If you don't, it, it becomes a lot harder to be able to have both training grants at those locations, as Dr. Klein was saying, but also to be able to house um, smaller grants there. Um, uh, larger funding agencies want to go to places that they know that these grants can get done. Um, and there are is, is a lot of infrastructure at larger universities to be able to support this. So many of us do help and mentor those who are not at these institutions. So find mentors to be able to help and to give you that information. Thank you, Dr. Staten. All right, moving on to the next question. So this question is for um, junior researcher, researchers like myself. Sorry. All right. So, and so I would like to hear from all three of you too, if I can. Um, if any of you have mentored others in getting grant funding, what is the most helpful to your mentees? How do you help them and what advice uh, do you give what are what is expected of a grant funding uh, mentor? Um, let's start with Dr. Uh, Riker. Um, I think definitely honing in on the question that you're trying to answer with the project. Um, what gap are you filling? And really and you know, getting the aims the way that um, Dr. Klein mentioned, um, that they actually answer the question and aren't totally interdependent. Um, and then I've found the most helpful mentors actually do go in and, and basically writing your entire writing. They, um, you know, really critically tell you what is missing, what you need to improve on, where the lack of clarity is. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and um, and then anytime you get feedback from a previous iteration, because as Dr. Staten mentioned, we get more rejections than acceptances. How, like what is the best way to address some of the reviewer comments and, and deficiencies in the previous iteration to make it stronger and more fundable. Um, those are some important things to mentor on. Thank you. And then for Dr. Klein, um, I know you're a renowned researcher and for junior faculties like me, myself, how do we approach um, people like yourself in mentoring us, what improves our, our chances of having you to want to collaborate with us? If you can um, emphasize on that point. Well, I think I need to see that you're serious 
Um, I'm a mentor on, I think, five K-23s right now. One of them's a pulmonologist. He, uh, you just reminded me, he just sent me his K and I got to go in a redline and I'm being a terrible mentor. I just now <laughs> forgot about it until you mentioned it about redlining such a good that's such a good point about being a good mentor is really getting in there and mixing it up on the exact wording um it makes all the difference in the world but you you find somebody that's serious and to put it in the selfish sort of uh point of view i'm, I'm mentoring a guy named brandon mon from um oregon he's a great guy um i don't even know if i've ever met him in person but i'm convinced that if i don't help him then he's ultimately going to be a peer of mine that I don't know as well. And I would really like to be friends with him. I don't want to be enemies with him. I don't want him to not know who I am because that's really key to your career. You know, when I was young and getting started with pulmonary embolism, I reached out to Phil Wells. Now this is in like 1999 and Phil was kind of just out of his fellowship, but he already had, he, he already had the first version of the Wells score. And um, it was one of the best things I ever did was reach out to Phil and make Phil a friend. And I was just, a, I was, geez, I was 35 or something. I was a kid and I was scared to death to talk to him, but he just turned out to be a regular guy and made all the difference for me. But I think he also sensed that this client guy is not going to go away. He's like a barnacle. I mean, he's just going to be here. So I might as well make friends with him. And that's a big thing that I look for is, are you serious? Are you determined? And are you willing to do A0, A1, A0, A1? Because that's what I'm seeing with K23s right now is four tries. Four try. I got, I got two mentees right now that are on their A1 of their second submission. And I think they're going to get it. I think both of them will, but they haven't given up. And part of the reason they haven't given up is a little bit me saying, you know, don't give up, but it's, you know, the whole team telling them that and the fire in the belly, they have the fire in the belly. And that's what I'm looking for. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Staten, would you like to, um, have you, for you specifically, you're a renowned researcher yourself too. Here's to know if you have rejected, you know, because you're so busy yourself and you're mentoring so many people. Have you re rejected anybody? And you know how? What what advice would you give those people? Those uh, people who are asking you to mentor them. That's a great question. So, the first thing I try to do is to understand what the person needs, because everybody's at a different stage in life. Not everyone is going for a K twenty three. Um, some might need a little bit of hand holding. Some people might need every day touching base to make sure they're doing what they need to do. Um, and then I have to be very honest. I can't do that every day, touching base, telling you what you need to do. If that's what you need, you got to find a different sol a solution for that. Um, but very frank discussions about where the person wants to go, what they need to be able to get there, how much education they need or self-support they need to be able to do what they need to do. Um, and then what they would expect of me. I've had some mentees that are expecting like weekly meetings for an hour with me. Um, and that's just not possible. Um, it's not realistic but we have to have that discussion up front. It doesn't mean that I don't wanna work with you. It just means that we have to figure out how to get you so you don't need weekly meetings for an hour um, until you're at a phase where you might, right? And then we switch it around. Um, so it, there needs to be a lot of very frank discussion, a lot of self-learning about how you learn, how you work, what areas of growth and development that you need and how to do that. And not all of that has to come from the same person, nor should it come from the same person. Um, so I think team mentoring is a very important thing because it allows other people to learn as well. Um, and sometimes peer mentoring is a part of that process where we have uh, two learners who have uh, expertise in different areas that can teach each other what needs to happen. So um, I, I have had to turn people down more so because I, I don't think I can give them what they need at that time or I'm not the expert for them, but I have sent them on to other people who are those experts. Um, and that's what I think many of us would do because we want to support others and we are eager and we want to help. We just want to make sure that we can do right by our mentees by dedicating the time we need and having the expertise that they need. Thank you. Excellent. All right, so moving on to the next question. For the more experienced grant-funded researchers, let's talk about federal grants and the different types of NIH grants, the R and the K series. 
What are they and how do you get one? What are the challenges that researchers face in getting this level of funding? So we're going to ask Dr. Klein to answer this question for us. Yeah, the, the reality is is pretty scary. I mean, there are there are stories of people who get out without a research fellowship that you know are able to put together a team, get a great mentor, and you know get a fundable score on a K on their first or second submission. But by and large, this day it requires formalized research training, a master's. Um, and then you have to propose additional training in your K. Um, I'm almost to the point where I think a, a de novo R when you when you get the um, early stage investigator ten points is easier to get than a K. Um, that's just and also your your chair is going to like it a lot better because they make a lot more money off of an R. They lose a ton of money off of a K. When it comes to money, I, I name a number that people don't like to hear, but it's the truth. If I have a right out of residency faculty member who says, I'm going to dedicate my life to research. I'm going to fall on the sword and it, I'm going to be a monk. And that's all I'm going to do is research. All right. And we say, well, this person's great. We're in as a department. The investment for that person to get to a K that's fundable is between 500000 and a million dollars from the department. 500,000 to a million bucks. And, you know, of course your department's already saying we don't have any money to do anything already, but that's the reality because, you know, there's, there's gotta be about three years of protected time. There really needs to be a master's of clinical investigation or something equivalent to that. Not exactly that, but something equivalent masters of public health in there. Um, time to collect preliminary data, put the team together, write the grant. And um, all of that taken together is about 500,000 and that assumes that you get funded within about five years, which most people don't. So that's, it, it takes a lot and uh, a real commitment from, you know, from departments. And departments of internal medicine are, are used to this in, um, you know, big research institutions, but emergency medicine's not. Not many chairs understand this. Thank you for answering this question. All right, we're going to move on to the next question because I want to hear all three of you on this question also. So if you could have done anything different with your career path in regards to being a grant-funded researcher, what would you have done differently? So let's start with Dr. Eicher on this question. Um. So I think a mistake I made early on is thinking that my first grant would carry me for any length of time. Um, and so some of the things I learned are that you really need to go ahead and start your multiple lines of research early. If being primarily a, a grant funded researcher is what you end up wanting to do. Um, and I actually didn't realize how much I would enjoy it until I started my first project. Um, and so you really have to start writing grants like almost every cycle uh, and each research line sort of on a different time frame because while one is going, you know, you're not gonna get the data for a few years to be able to apply for that next cycle. So you need another research line that's going off, like off time from that, that's um, that you're applying for grants for. Um, so that's an important sort of logistical thing that I don't think you realize as an early investigator. And then Dr. Klein, would you like to um, comment on this? Well, what would you have done differently? Uh stop doing stupid stuff. Um, I should have been more incremental. I, I would should have taken my own advice. I mean, I tell my mentees, get the money first, then do what you want to do. Um, you know what gets you know what gets funded is a new coat of paint that works better than the old coat of paint. I always talk about this airplane analogy. Um, everybody wants to come in with a brand new airplane that's never been tested but it's going to be faster and it's going to be better and it's going to be awesome compared to the current airplane that we have. And 
they've bitten off too much. There's too much risk. The reviewers, even though it's innovative, reviewers hate risk. I mean, they're more miserly with tax money than they are their own money. Reviewers really feel hurt when they approve for funding something they don't think is going to work. But you come in with a new coat of paint, it's a little bit lighter. It's a little bit more resistant to bird poop. And it makes the plane fly 1% better. And it's better than the last paint. Guess which grant gets funded? The new paint. I wish I would have done more of that rather than say, I, yeah, I'm, I'm strong. You know, I'm going to reinvent the plane. Now, I did too much of that. And I should have done more incremental work and then had, you know, the money to do the more speculative things. But I spent a lot of time writing grants that were goofy in the end. All right, and then Dr. Staten. Well, the first thing is I would have started earlier. Um, I, after residency, I went into a fellowship where I could do research. But in residency, I never did any research. I had no idea what it was like. And I wish I would have hopped on the opportunities that were there. And I just didn't know that I would have liked it so much. Um, I didn't know I would like it this much that it would be like my entire life to be perfectly honest. So, so try, try more things and try them earlier. Um, I actually am going back and getting more education now through a PhD that I wish I've done that earlier too, right? Cause my field in implementation science is growing and changing and adapting quite quickly. And, um, I got to stay up to date on it. So getting more training now is an interesting time to do it, but it, it, if I could have done that earlier too, that would have been great. One of the other things would be to know that you can do it or try for it. What's the worst thing that can happen? Because I think a lot of the grants that I looked at, I was like, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Or I don't have that expertise. I can't, I can't handle it. But then I, when I finally tried, I did. So I think just, just trying what's the worst thing that can happen, getting a team together, having some, um, uh, taking some risks to get out there and just try it and see what happens, asking some hard questions, finding some people in a team who you like working with um, and just seeing what happens. Thank you for all the answers. So this is our um, last question here. For anyone who has never applied for a grant before, what would you recommend that they do learn more about grant funding, such as getting mentorship or educating themselves more about grant writing process. So Dr. Eicher, you are a opioid uh, research specialist. Do you mind uh, com uh, answering this question for us? Sure, there are actually quite a few resources out there. Um, uh, the SAM Grant Writing Workshop is actually quite an excellent um, experience. You really want to make sure you're coming into it with an idea already that you've already started writing on because these experiences are much better if you're doing it as more of a hands-on approach. Um, so even if it's just your first draft of your AIMS page, getting the feedback is much more um, helpful than just trying to treat it like a didactic um, experience. Um, but then there are also some NIH free resources out there. Um, a lot of institutions have their own grant writing um, uh, webinars. And then, um, and then there are a few that are just written by really amazing writers. Um, I know at Duke we had one by a professor Gopin who just really helps you figure out exactly how to write from the reader's perspective. Um, but a lot of those, yeah, so figuring out what connections you have and then um, uh, and utilizing what's available. And then we're, since we have a, a couple more minutes, Dr. Klein, would you like to answer this question as well? Well, I agree that uh, the, the job of medical school is to take someone who um, really didn't write a whole lot in college because most people that are doing pre-med are focusing on science courses. I mean, very few are literary majors. I mean, a lot of read a lot, but not everybody writes a lot in, in college. And then we put you through med school and we teach you how to not write. We teach you how to say, 
if K greater than five, then give insulin plus glucose, except we abbreviate all that. And it is this like this if then logic, nobody teaches you to, I mean, you med school squeegees out any creative writing ability that you have. It actually doesn't help you organize. So the only way you're going to be able to overcome that is to just sit down in front of, um, you know, your, this, the researcher's instrument that makes money is the computer and you have to sit down at it and you have to type and then get someone to go over it with you. You have to do it. You, know, you can't talk about it. You got to get started, get your concepts down. And, you know, then we can get to the actual wordsmithing. I, you just, you got to try, got to jump in the water. And Dr. Satan, would you like to answer? Yeah, I agree. Doing it is going to teach you. I love getting a team together that includes a mentor, partners in the process, throwing words around so that we get all excited about it and real hyped to do it. And then locking myself in a room to get it onto a piece of paper so that people can then redline it and move it from there. I think you have to find out your process and what works for you. Try to identify which mentors are going to point you in the right direction of which resources are for you at the time period when you need them um, and to move the clutter away because sometimes there can be a million other things in your way. Um, but ultimately, you just have to sit down and try it. Thank you. Um, just so everyone know, I'm a, currently a research fellow at UC San Diego. I first learned about grant writing. I didn't know anything about it. I thought anybody can just go and apply for an NIH grant. I did not know anything about having a mentoring team, an a AIMS page. I didn't know any of that. And I learned all that at the SAM grant writing workshop. So we highly recommend uh, taking that course. And as Dr. Eicher had said, you need to have an idea already, and there's a lot of resource, resources out there uh, on the SAM page and also on online that you can look at. All right, so we are wondering if any audience have any questions for us. Sorry, my Any audience questions? All right, and anything else that our panelists want to add? Hey, well, that's the end of our uh, uh, learning series. Thank you so much again for all the panelists for being with us today. I am definitely going to go back and uh, to watch this um, module. I love it. I, I learned a lot so much from all of you guys. So thank you so much. All right, and that's all we have today. Thank you for uh, everybody, everyone for attending the session.